Jack held high as the British team captain. And a second goal for England. Ian Wright has scored for his country. Good evening. A father explained in harrowing detail today. Most of the British public love Trevor McDonald. Trevor, you know, isn't thought of as a black newsreader anymore. Trevor's just the newsreader. And I think that says something about the way we've moved on in this country. The Britain of 50 years ago was a very different place. In 1948, the nation was still counting the cost of victory in World War II. It was a country about to lose an empire and it was a country that was almost exclusively white. But Britain was about to face the biggest wave of non-white immigration in its history, a wave that would bring half a million people from the West Indies. June 21st, 1948. Although the Windrush had come 5,000 miles to Britain, to most on board it seemed like a homecoming. Back in the colonial Caribbean they had left, Everyone was steeped in a way of life that was entirely British. The king was our king. The flag was our flag. How more British could we get? And we lived it. When World War II broke out in 1939, it seemed entirely natural that 10,000 West Indians would volunteer for the war effort. This squadron, Jamaica's squadron, was named after the island that paid for the planes. But it was in manpower rather than money that the Caribbean made its biggest contribution. I was still in college at the time, and I remember these white men came from England, and they took these, what we call trucks, you know, open trucks, and they went to all the country past, the little nooks and crannies, and they begged people to come and fight for your motherland, come and fight for England, because we need you. When the appeal was made, I remember going to the then Labour office in Kingston, and um, there were literally thousands of fellows there, eager to come to Britain to do something. We were just young lads in the prime of our youth who the bell rings and we answer the bell for help towards the war effort and we volunteered. We weren't forced or pushed or coerced. Everybody was doing it as young lads in those days. Flying officer Ulrich Cross to speak for West Indians in the services. Ulrich is a navigator in one of our own bomber squadrons. Well, it's a job to know where to start. There are so many of us doing so many different things. In the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, in Air Sea Rescue and the Marines. In the RENS, the ATS, the WAF and the Nursing Services. Together with others from the British Commonwealth of Nations, with men and women from the rest of the United Nations, West Indians are fighting for the new world that we all want to see. Thank you, Elric, and happy landing. In England, School children would stop you to ask you the time, and you know they just wanted to hear you speak. <laughs> People were happy that we were here. They showed their happiness. We were made welcome. Today, West Indians have common citizenship and common cause with us, and they have come over to help us. In the crew. But with Hitler defeated, British attitudes to the West Indians changed abruptly. I was on a bus and there were two service people in front of me, one a woman, and she was saying it's it about time they went back to their homes. And it was the first time that it hit me that, you know, that people were putting up with us. But they didn't really want us, but we were a necessary evil sort of thing. After the war, most West Indians returned to the Caribbean, but some re-enlisted for further military service. In 1947, 250 young RAF men went home on leave to the Caribbean, planning to return to England after a few weeks. Few realized the historic impact their example would have. Economic conditions in the Caribbean were harsh. The sugar fields had always been the region's main employer but a hurricane in 1944 had laid waste to the island's crops. 
It was not the first time this had happened, but in the past, men had been able to find seasonal work in America. Now, new immigration laws had closed the doors to the United States. It was from this harbor in Kingston, Jamaica, that the Empire Windrush set sail on its pioneering voyage. It was the 24th of May, 1948. Across the Atlantic, the first warnings were being sounded in England. MPs, led by Manchester's William Griffiths, call on the Minister of Labour to act. Order! Order! Will he do everything possible to dissuade the irresponsible people who are sending shiploads of West Indians to this country without there being any jobs here waiting for them? The government response was clear. Commonwealth citizens could not be turned away. The Empire Windrush brings to Britain 500 Jamaicans, citizens of the British Empire coming to the mother country with good intent. Suitcase, isn't it? Probably it's because they was all tensed up to what they was going to, what was going to happen to them. You know. Call it a fear, I suppose, you know, that made them look cold. I often wondered how they all got on. I used to often think about them, wonder how they got on. As the Windrush migrants began to establish themselves, the then conservative government began to see a solution to its most acute problem, the shortage of labor in the public services, such as transport. The recruitment drive even took officials to the Caribbean. This campaign triggered a second wave of immigration far larger than the first. During the 1950s, nearly a quarter of a million West Indians arrived in England. Most of them were quite outgoing. They wanted to integrate, uh, and I mean, they didn't necessarily sort of go quite the right way about it. They had, as far as some people were concerned, a lot of unpleasant habits. In Jamaica, this is the normal way to attract the attention of the man behind the bar. In English pubs, they don't approve of it. A noise, of course. I mean, <laughs> their uh, music tastes weren't necessarily those of the normal local people. Uh, and um, gradually resentment began to build up. As their neighbors' coldness gradually turned to hostility, a menacing new slogan appeared, Keep Britain White. The corner shop, and they would be served before me, you know. And I would stand there, of course, to reserve to say anything about it. I remember that one blonde woman with a basket in her hand, she said, these niggers are everywhere, everywhere. I mean, you can't get rid of them everywhere. We went through them with the war, and we went through them, you know, we, we, we have them here, everywhere. Still the numbers grew, and just as surely, so did the hostility. There's lots of talk about discrimination, and all sorts of allegations, that because coloured workers have different coloured skins, that British people don't like them. That isn't the reason at all. There are good, realistic reasons why objections have been raised. First of all, the ones of personal habits. Some of them wash with oil. Oil with a strong smell. It can be very unpleasant if you're working close to them. That's something that the average British worker doesn't like. I wouldn't let my sister go out with one of them, you know. No decent girl would go out with a black man, this kind of talk. We used to come back to Lyceum nearly every weekend and we used to meet up and things was going fine. We was courting and everything, you know, <clears throat> until my family found out. My family hit the roof. They hit. White people would never speak to you. As they used to pass you, they used to spit. It was terrible. You know, it's 
people can be so cruel. Why? I mean, we're all human beings. No niggers need apply. Rooms for rent, no one again, you see, no Irish or niggers. That's not unusual. And that is the sort of conditions that uh, existed. A landmark BBC documentary followed one West Indian, Ben Bousquet, on a fruitless quest for accommodation. The BBC um, followed me around. I've heard that you've got rooms going. And I wasn't... I've got a room at the home. I can't let you in. Beg your pardon? I can't let you in. Um, I I've got uh, 14 English boys in here. 14 English boys? Yes. They don't want... Um, I, can't, I can't mix. I'm ever so sorry. I wouldn't sell. But if I let you come in, all my boys would yeah. leave. If you want me to come in... If I let you come in, all the other ones would go. Yes. OK. I'm um, so sorry. Yeah. Um, People made a sort of <laughs> silly excuses. I wouldn't have you because um, my husband wouldn't like it. I, just, I know I don't take blacks um, and, and things like that. This was awful. It is an awful experience. The new arrivals were forced into overcrowded, unsafe properties, which most whites would reject. But the appalling living conditions weren't the worst of Rachmanism. You know, you didn't pay your rent out. Because we didn't have anybody to turn to. We had nobody to turn to. to know that the Windrush generation have been living here legally. Tougher immigration rules were brought in by Theresa May when she was Home Secretary, where, in her own words, a hostile environment was created to expel illegal immigrants. Remember those vans? The problem is that a lot of the Windrush generations never applied for a British passport when they arrived here, because back then the kids would have travelled on their parents' passports when they came to this country. When their parents or grandparents passed away, they were then left with no idea of their own. And... It's been described as gimmicky, divisive, disastrous, cheap, and a return to the 70s politics of the National Front. The van with the misleading go-home message to illegal immigrants has had a short shelf life. It survived two weeks on the road through certain immigrant communities in London during the summer, but today the Home Secretary admitted it was not a good idea. I think politicians should be well, willing to step up to the plate and say when they think something actually hasn't been uh, as good an idea, and I think it, they were too blunt an instrument. Richard Stewart was a British cricket star in the 1960s, playing for Middlesex, good enough to be a homegrown player, and yet this Windrush child can't get a British passport. If he was a second-class citizen, really, that's all I'm down as, you know. But you get used to it, being back... You know, we get used to it, so we accept it. And I, though it's not right, there's nothing we can do about it. Now 73, he's deemed an illegal. It's a bitter rejection from a place he's called home since he was 10 years old. I'm more angry about it and disappointed because the fact is that when I was um, playing cricket, I was classified as uh, home ground, grown player, not overseas player, so I come all of a sudden, I'm an overseas player. Ryan came to the UK from Jamaica with his family in 1965. At only seven years old, he arrived on his brother's passport. When he recently tried to apply for his own British passport to visit his mum in Jamaica, he had no proof of ID, so immigration came knocking. They said I'm illegal. Their job is to remove me out of the country. They had a plane ticket for me. When I found my missus, I said to her, they tell me that they got a plane ticket for me and they're going to move me out of the country. These individuals, having been here from childhood, 
had no sense in their minds that they're not British. And that is really the tragedy of it. Prime Minister's questions, Mrs May apologised again to the Windrush children. I want to say sorry to anyone who has been caused has confusion or anxiety. There was no getting away from Labour's attempt to lay the blame at her door for the destruction of Windrush documentation, but she was ready with a zinger of her own, trying to shift the blame onto Labour. Did the Prime Minister, the then Home Secretary, sign off that decision? Prime Minister. No, the decision to destroy the landing cards was taken in 2009 under a Labour government. But whenever the decision was taken, the documentation belonging to the scores of names on these lists from the National Archives were destroyed by a department under her watch. The accusation now is that she lost sight of British people in her pursuit of meeting immigration targets. After days of trying to clean up the mess, today the blame game began over who's responsible for the destruction of landing cards. But be under no doubt, the buck here stops with Theresa May, focus now shifting towards the tightening of immigration laws when she was Home Secretary, of creating a hostile environment for illegal immigrants. But the problem was she caught up a number of innocent citizens in that net. We recognise that this has been a whole episode of shame. And actually, the policy that sits behind it, creating a hostile environment, Having a go at immigrants is something that now needs proper, comprehensive review. Does it sometimes feel a bit lonely in the Commons when you feel like you're the person that has to stand up and make these arguments because there's so many people in there that just don't have any agency with these sorts of issues? Look, when I stood up, I'm really summoning up my parents who aren't with us anymore, but I know that they would expect me to speak up um, and I know how proud they were of this country and how sad they would be of this moment. Um, we've not got to the place that we need to as a nation. Here in Bristol, those who are part of the Windrush generation have lived this history and painted it on their city walls. 113 cases are now being investigated by the Home Office, while Mr Lammy has called for a parliamentary debate next week. Dozens of lives disrupted, plenty more fallout and plenty more stories to tell. When immigration rules changed in 1971, anyone from the Windrush generation living in the UK was automatically given indefinite leave to remain. But the Home Office didn't keep a record of those people, and it's estimated more than 50,000 may not have registered their right to live here. To prove they're living legally in the country, they were asked to provide at least one document, sometimes more, like a payslip, medical record, bank statement for every year that they've been in the country. That could mean finding a doctor's note from 50 years ago. I mean, would you be able to find one from three years ago, let alone half a century? For most, the UK is the only home they know. Until now, they have never questioned whether they belonged here. Theresa May was urged by at least 140 MPs across Parliament to change this policy. More than 130,000 people signed a petition asking the government to grant the Windrush generation amnesty. Labour's David Lammy made an impassioned speech to the Home Secretary Amber Rudd in the Commons. This is a day of national shame and it has come about because of a hostile environment policy that was begun under her Prime Minister. The UK Immigration Minister Caroline Noakes admits that terrible mistakes have been made. These are people who we welcomed here way back in the 50s and 60s and it's really important to me that we correct any error and that we send a message of reassurance to people who are here. We want to get this right for them. Theresa May has apologised to Commonwealth leaders for the anxiety caused over the controversy. That's probably a good sign for people here. The only problem is, is that some people might have already been deported. Windrush Task Force has now been set up by the Home Secretary Amber Rudd to address the situation. But the Home Office has stressed the importance of a robust immigration policy to root out those who actually are here illegally. Given the attention this story has got, it's likely the government will find a solution to this issue. But for the Windrush generation, Will it really make up for the way that many of their lives were turned upside down?